Hello everybody. So in the last capsule, you recall that we have discussed Fayer's theorem. We gave a complete proof of Fayer's theorem. Recall what is the statement of Fayer's theorem? Suppose you have a 2 pi periodic continuous function. You got a 2 pi periodic continuous function. We know that the Fourier series of f may not converge pointwise. In other words, if Sn fx is the nth partial sum of the Fourier series, then we know that Sn fx need not converge. But it does converge in the sense of Cesaro. Sn fx may not converge pointwise, but it would converge in the sense of Cesaro. Indeed, it converges uniformly in the sense of Cesaro. That is the content of Ayer's theorem. So we have continuity. We don't have anything better than continuity. We don't have pointwise convergence of the Fourier series, but we have Cesaro convergence of the partial sums of the Fourier series. Not only that, we have an additional bonus that this convergence of the arithmetic means is uniform. So now we see this in the slide on uh, theorem 31 that you see displayed is a statement of the Fayer's theorem. The arithmetic means of S0, S1, S2, etc. converges to f of x uniformly. So today we continue from here and we discuss a few applications of Fayer's theorem. An immediate corollary of Fayer's theorem is that the set of trigonometric polynomials is dense in the space of 2 pi periodic continuous functions in the following sense. If you take a 2 pi periodic continuous function, for every epsilon greater than 0, there is a trigonometric polynomial Pnx such that supremum f of x minus Pnx, the supremum is taken over mod x less than or equal to pi, that is less than epsilon. I have put epsilon by root 2 pi for convenience. We will see why the root 2 pi comes in very soon. What is the trigonometric polynomial? It is simply a finite linear combination of 1 cos x sin x cos 2x sin 2x dot 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 cos nx sin nx dot dot dot. So you take this system of functions 1 sin x cos x sin 2x cos 2x and take finite linear combinations of these. Those are the trigonometric polynomials. And you take a continuous function f of x, which is 2 pi periodic. Let epsilon greater than 0 be arbitrary. What does Fayer's theorem say? Fayer's theorem says that there exists an n naught such that for n bigger than n naught, the arithmetic mean 1 upon n into s naught plus s1 plus s2 plus dot 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 plus sn. That difference fx minus this arithmetic mean is less than epsilon uniformly. But what is this arithmetic mean 1 upon n times s0 plus s1 plus s2 plus dot 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 plus sn? What is sj? sj is the jth partial sum of the Fourier series. So sj itself is a trigonometric polynomial. So s0 plus s1 plus s2 plus dot 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 plus sn is a trigonometric polynomial divided by 1 upon n you get a trigonometric polynomial. These arithmetic means that you see in the statement of Fayer's theorem, the left hand side of 3.1, 1 upon n times s0 plus s1 plus s2 plus dot 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 plus sn, that's a trigonometric polynomial. The sequence of trigonometric polynomials converges uniformly to f of x. So Fayer's theorem immediately gives us that the trigonometric polynomials are dense in the space of 2 pi periodic continuous functions with respect to the soup norm. Okay, so that was a very important corollary. And now, why is it important? Now, the next exercise asks you to show that if f is in L2 of minus pi pi, if f is in L2 of minus pi pi, then there exists a trigonometric polynomial p and x such that the L2 norm of fx minus p and x is less than epsilon. Is this clear? If f of x is continuous, if f of x is continuous, the previous theorem, the previous corollary says that the supremum mod fx minus pnx is less than epsilon by root 2 pi. 
So let us square it. Mod fx minus pnx squared less than epsilon squared by 2 pi. Integrate from minus pi to pi. What do you get? Integral minus pi to pi mod fx minus pnx squared dx less than epsilon squared. Take the square root. What do you get? The L2 norm, you get the fact that the L2 norm of fx minus pnx is less than epsilon. So we get that the, the trigonometric polynomials are dense in the space of 2 pi periodic continuous functions with respect to L2 norm with respect to L2 norm. So from approximation in sup norm, we get an approximation in L2 norm. Now from continuous functions, we must pass on to all L2 functions. What, what we have shown so far, if f of x is a 2 pi periodic continuous function, then this approximation happens in L2 norm. But now we must leave the realm of continuous functions and we must prove this L2 estimate this L2 approximation for all f in L2 of minus pi pi. Let us see how to do that. Trigonometric polynomials are dense in L2 of minus pi pi. So the function that we are going to take is not continuous, it is simply in L2. So suppose if f is in L2 of minus pi pi, then given any epsilon greater than 0, there is a trigonometric polynomial p and x such that the L2 norm of fx minus p and x is less than epsilon. Let us look at the proof of this. The proof proceeds in four easy steps. First, let epsilon greater than zero be arbitrary. Now, by Lusin's theorem, by Lusin's theorem, there is a continuous function g from minus pi pi such that integral from minus pi to pi mod fx minus gx the whole squared dx less than epsilon squared by 8. That is step 1. Now, let us look at step 2. Let us take m to be the supremum of gx. Now we will work with gx now. Let m be the supremum of gx. Then there is a delta greater than 0 such that the integral of mod fx squared dx for mod x bigger than or equal to pi minus delta and put a throw in the factor 2. And then integral m squared dx constant mod x bigger than or equal to pi minus delta throw in the factor 2 less than epsilon squared by 8. Of course, I could have put the 2 on the right hand side, I could have written it as epsilon squared by 16. In other words, the contribution of mod fx squared and m squared from the ends of the interval, you got the interval from minus pi to pi. So cut out a delta piece here and cut out a delta piece here. Look at the piece from pi minus delta to pi and look at this piece from minus pi to minus pi plus delta. From the two ends, you take a small piece of length epsilon on either ends, you chop it out. The contribution from these small pieces, these tiny pieces or these little tukdas as it were, that contribution is less than epsilon squared by 16. That is very easy to see because f is in L2, mod f squared is in L1. So when you have a function which is L, L1, then if the interval over which you are integrating is terribly small, then the contribution is going to be made terribly small. So this is a very easy step, but it's a useful step. How do we proceed from there? Now let us take step 3. Now what we will do is that we will take a continuous function g, now we will take a continuous function capital Gx such that capital Gx equal to small gx on the major part of the interval mod x less than or equal to pi minus delta. Remember we cut out those two little pieces on the two ends on the remaining large piece minus pi plus delta to pi minus delta on the large piece this capital Gx equals little gx. Now you define capital G to be 0 at plus minus pi. At plus minus pi you define the function to be 0. Now, what does Tietze's extension theorem tell you from general topology? What is Tietze's extension theorem? You got a metric space, you got a metric space capital X, you got a closed subset A, you got a closed subset A and you got a continuous function on the closed subset A into the real numbers. Then this continuous function will extend 
continuously to whole of x. And further, the extension will also have the same bounds as the original function. This is the important Tietze's extension theorem from general topology. So here in this particular context, what is the metric space? The closed interval minus pi pi. What are the closed subspace that we are talking about? It is mod x less than or equal to pi minus delta. And throw in these two endpoints plus pi and minus pi. So on mod x less than or equal to pi minus delta, I had defined the function capital GX. At the end points, I defined this function capital GX. So this capital GX is continuous on this closed subset that I am talking about. By Tietze's extension theorem, this will extend continuously to the closed interval minus pi pi. It will extend continuously to capital X which is minus pi pi. Further, the bound on capital G is the same as the bound on little g which is capital M. And now, this capital G is a continuous function from minus pi to pi and it vanishes at the two end points. So take its 2 pi periodic extension, extend it as a 2 pi periodic function. This 2 pi periodic function will be continuous because it is 0 at both ends. So now let us look at integral minus pi to pi mod fx minus gx the whole square. Now this integral I will break it into a bunch of integrals. The first piece is over mod x less than or equal to pi minus delta. But when mod x is less than or equal to pi minus delta, what is capital GX? Capital GX is the same as little gx. So that's what we get the first piece. And then the second piece is integral over mod x greater than or equal to pi minus delta. When mod x is greater than or equal to pi minus delta, uh, what is this mod fx minus gx the whole squared? Expand mod fx squared plus mod gx squared minus twice fx gx. And I will get two times integral from mod x bigger than or equal to pi minus delta mod fx squared plus mod gx squared, right? And now this piece mod fx minus gx the whole squared is less than epsilon squared by 8. Because that's how we chose that's how we chose the g, remember? We got this epsilon squared by 8 and I get from there, it is certainly like this first piece is definitely less than epsilon squared by 8. Now we need to manipulate this. Mod g has been replaced by m because my bound is preserved for the, for the extension. So I get mod fx squared plus m squared. And I know from step 2 that this is going to be less than epsilon squared by this is going to be less than epsilon squared by 8. So put that also over here and I get epsilon squared by 4. This total contribution is less than epsilon squared by 4. So the L2 norm of F minus capital G is less than epsilon by 2. Step 4, I have already indicated that we will be extending this capital G as a 2 pi periodic continuous function which is perfectly fine because the capital G vanishes at both the ends. Now by Fayer's theorem applied to capital G, I can apply Fayer's theorem to capital G, there is a trigonometric polynomial Px such that mod capital G minus capital P is less than epsilon by 2. Now finally let us apply the triangle inequality, the L2 norm of F minus P is less than or equal to the L2 norm of F minus capital G plus the L2 norm of capital G minus capital P, correct? The L2 norm of F minus capital G is less than epsilon by 2 from the previous step and by choice of this P, the L2 norm of capital G minus capital P is less than epsilon. So all in all, we have proved the theorem. We have proved the theorem which is stated as a title of this slide, trigonometric polynomials are dense in L2 of minus pi pi, namely given any epsilon greater than 0 and given an L2 function f, this is a trigonometric polynomial P such that the L2 norm of f minus p is less than epsilon. That concludes this very important corollary of Fayer's theorem. We are going to use this very important corollary of Fayer's theorem to complete the proof of Parseval's formula of chapter 2 that was left out. So let's proceed to that. Now let us recall Parseval's formula from the last chapter. Parseval's formula says that if f is in L2 
of minus pi pi then 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi 2 pi mod fx squared dx. The left hand side of equation 3.4 that is displayed in the slide that is the energy of the signal. The right hand side of 3.4 tells you how to calculate the energy of the signal using the Fourier components mod a naught squared plus one half summation j from one, 1 to infinity mod a j squared plus mod b j squared. We have to prove this theorem, we have not proved it completely. Right? We only got the inequality, the Bessel's inequality we got. Remember? It is useful to recall at this point that if Pn is a trigonometric polynomial of degree capital N, then its nth partial sum will agree with Pn for n greater than or equal to n, capital N. You must think about this, this is very easy to prove. You take a, take a trigonometric polynomial Pnx, alpha naught plus alpha 1 cos x plus beta 1 sin x plus dot 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 plus alpha capital N cos capital Nx plus beta n sin capital Nx. I just stop it with that and calculate the Fourier series of Pnx. What are the Fourier series of Pnx? Pnx itself. Pnx itself is a Fourier series of Pnx. So the nth partial sum Sn of Pnx is going to be exactly Pnx when little n exceeds capital N. So the first comment here in this slide is actually a completely trivial comment but it is going to be explicitly used very soon so I thought it is best to put it up here. You must think about it if it is not clear to you a few moments of reflection will co convince you of this. Now let us proceed. Let us take a function f in L2 of minus pi pi. Then by Pythagoras' theorem, we proved this already that f minus Sn is orthogonal to Sn. When we looked at the least square approximation in the previous chapter, you must go back to the previous chapter and you must check that we have proved 3.5. That Pythagoras' theorem says that norm f minus Sn squared plus norm Sn squared is norm f squared because Sn is orthogonal to f minus Sn. The thing written in blue is orthogonal to the thing written in red in this equation 3.5. Now we will see that 3.4 will now follow from 3.5 if we can show that this red thing goes to 0. If we can prove that this red thing goes to 0 then allowing n to go to infinity over here will give you 2 pi times this left hand side of 3.4. If I multiply the left hand side of 3.4 by 2 pi, I will get 3.5. And I have to just check that this blue thing that is written here, norm Sn fx squared. What will be norm of Sn fx squared? The thing written in blue here, norm Sn fx squared, if you compute it, it's a finite sum. You're going to get exactly 2 pi times mod a naught squared plus pi times summation j from 1 to n mod a j squared plus mod b j squared. That's exactly going to be norm s n f x squared. When you calculate norm s n f x squared, I repeat, you are going to get just this part except that j will go from 1 to n. So obviously when I allow n to go to infinity, when I allow the n to go to infinity, this item here norm Sn fx squared will converge to 2 pi times mod a naught squared plus pi times summation j from 1 to infinity mod a j squared plus mod b j squared. So the result 3.4 does indeed follow if we show norm f minus Sn fx squared goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. The last line in this slide is what we need to establish right now and we proceed for that. Let us use 3.5 to f minus pn where pn is a trigonometric polynomial with n greater than or equal to n. Instead of f we apply the 
previous thing to f minus pn. So what does 3.5 read? f minus pn minus sn of f minus pn norm squared plus sn of f minus pn norm squared equal to f minus pn norm squared. Now what is sn of f minus pn? It is sn of f minus sn of pn which is sn of f minus pn. Remember that when little n is greater than or equal to capital N, I get, I, I get sn of pn is the same as pn, the first comment I made in the last slide. So what do we get? Norm f minus sn fx squared plus norm sn of f minus pn squared equal to norm f minus pn squared. That's exactly what we get. Whereby we conclude that norm f minus sn of fx is less than or equal to f minus pn norm. I just knock this term off, this becomes an inequality. But now we know given any epsilon greater than 0, there exists a trigonometric polynomial pn such that this right hand side norm f minus p capital N is less than epsilon. And so we conclude that for little n bigger than capital N, we have that norm f minus sn fx is less than epsilon. So this concludes the proof of Parseval formula that was left out in chapter 2 and now we have completed it. We need not have waited for this chapter. We could have done this in the last chapter itself. One could instead of using Fayer's theorem, we could have used Warstas approximation theorem. What is Warstas approximation theorem? That a continuous function from minus pi to pi can be approximated by polynomials. Now from algebraic polynomials, right? a0 plus a1t plus a2t squared plus dot 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 plus akt to the power k. You have to now pass from algebraic polynomials to trigonometric polynomials. There is a way to do that and one could directly obtain the Parseval's formula as a corollary of the Weierstrass approximation formula. That's not difficult, but rather I, I thought this would be a very nice application of Fayer's theorem, a very important application of Fayer's theorem. So the next thing to do, look at in the next capsule will be how Fayer's theorem allows us to prove a very important result in number theory. So we are going to see another application of Fourier analysis to problems in number theory. We already saw in the very first chapter how using Fourier analysis we get the beautiful Riemann's functional equation which is extremely important in analytic number theory. Here we look at a different aspect of analytic number theory, uniform distribution modulo 1. The literature on uniform distribution modulo 1 is very vast and what we will prove is a remarkable sharpening of a classical result of Kronecker, namely Weyl's equidistribution theorem. I think this is a very good place to stop this capsule, we will continue this next time. Thank you very much.